welcome to another episode of Better Today, Healthier Tomorrow. We are here with Dr. John Odin to celebrate Diabetes Awareness Month. Hello, and thank you for joining us. Hello. Uh, nice to be here. This is a special episode to celebrate uh, Diabetes Awareness Month, but also talk about endocrinology and what exactly that is, because it's a word that I had to look up. And I'm really? okay with admitting that. I know it's a word and I've seen it written down, but I wanted to know exactly what it was. And so today we're gonna dig into that. Right. Uh, to start, tell me what you do here. What is your position? Um, so I have been uh, the division chief or section chief for uh, endocrinology and diabetes uh, in the pediatric department for the past eight years. Um, that means I see um, a lot of kids with endocrine problems, which we'll talk about in diabetes, but um, also kind of run the mill, kind of run the back scenes of how to kind of get faculty members and staff members to participate in clinic. And that's a job in itself, isn't it? It is. It's like six jobs, <laughs> six jobs in one. And how long have you been doing what you do? Um, it's been about eight years now. So I think I, I joined the faculty um, late April, early May in 2015. And all of that time here at Arkansas Children's? All of it here, yes. Can you tell me what drew you to endocrinology? Sure. I can, I can tell you that um, when I was around nine years old, my dream was to become a Navy fighter pilot. Love airplanes, have always loved airplanes. I actually became a pilot very, very, very briefly. Never got my certification, but I, was, I, I flew for a little bit, loved it. Um, when I was much older. It gives me heart palpitations just thinking about it. But at 10 years of age, I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. And so when I was diagnosed, I was sent to a very prominent institution in Galveston called UTMB. Um, I was treated by a man by the name of Luther Travis, who was, and Ben Brohard, Luther Travis and Ben Brohard. Uh, they were both very prominent names in diabetes and endocrinology. Um, they actually wrote one of the textbooks for diabetes. And they just inspired me to be what they were, which was initially to become a doctor, right? But as I did, um, kind of moved on through my training, got through with college, got into medical school, residency. Um, I knew I didn't want to be a surgeon. I knew I wanted to be a pediatrician, which ended up being an endocrinologist. How does your experience as a child influence how you treat your patients now? I think it shows me a little bit more kind of insight into the daily um, grind of having a, a cr complex and chronic disease. Um, I think I have a little bit more footing to understand what they're going through, but that also means that I know that, you know, some of the things that they're explaining to me um, can be overcome and I can give them some insight into how to do that. I've always said there's magic in shared experience, and I sure. can't imagine as a parent how amazing that would be to have a doctor who knows almost exactly what we are going through as a family with our child. That and that there is a, there is a pathway forward. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not gonna say a light at the end of the tunnel because there is no cure, but a pathway forward, meaning that they can become very successful in their life. Um, they can go to college, they can go to trade school, they can be a teacher, they can be a lawyer, they can be a doctor, they can be a pilot if they want to be now. You know, all of these things that essentially people just kind of put out of the back of their mind when they're first diagnosed with diabetes, but me kind of going over that with them helps out. That's amazing. Do you still fly? I don't. Um, any, any plans to get back to it? Uh, well, I, I, I wanted to, and I actually got the certificate from the FAA to do that, but then I contracted COVID again, and I developed kind of a, a vertigo oh. after COVID. I'm sorry to hear that. I yeah. do hope that you get back to it eventually. It sounds Maybe exciting. Someday. Maybe, Maybe someday. someday. Oh. So we discussed diabetes. What are some other common things that people come in for that are covered under the umbrella of endocrinology? So we, we see kids for things like thyroid disorders. Um, that includes anything from basic low thyroid or hypothyroidism, hyperthyroidism or high thyroid to things like um, thyroid cancer. Um, we also see kiddos who have concerns about their height, so short stature. Um, and then we see kids, of course, with obesity in our obesity management program called the COACH program. So when we think about everything endocrinology covers, it's hard for me to picture. I know it's um, glands, is right. that right? So when you picture the skeletal system, I can visualize that, I can see it. Um, how do you, 
how can you visualize all that you guys cover? Endocrinology is a very kind of intimidating specialty. It's intimidating to our families and it's intimidating to our local physicians. It's even intimidating to some of our brightest minds in this institution, like mm-hmm. nephrology and uh, cardiology. Um, we use a lot of visual aids. Um, I tend to kind of draw things out for families when, mm-hmm. when we're getting into the weeds of what a hormone does. Um, but we use things like models and, and pictures mm-hmm. to kind of show what a hormone does, where it comes from, where it goes, what it attaches to, and what its actions are. And so when we get into the kind of that degree of detail with a family, and sometimes we have to, sometimes we right. don't, um, we do have to be very, very slow, very directed, um, and use these kind of visual aids to help out. That's exactly the answer I was going for. You know, as a parent that comes in and is trying to understand, like, what it is that's actually going on, you know, you can picture a bone and you know, but yeah. it's so hard. I'm happy to know you have visual aids because that's always helpful to me. We do, yeah. Um, so you've developed a board game. Yes. Speaking of not understanding this stuff at all. Developed I'm is a strong probably, word, but yes, yeah. in the process. You're of. in the process of creating what sounds like a really exciting board game that right. will help physicians understand all of this. Can you tell me a little bit about it? Yeah, so a couple of years ago, um, I, I was, I, I got an email from, I think, uh, our chairman, and he was talking about the education system in one way or, or another. And I thought, well, you know, that he's absolutely right. Um, educating medical students, my daughter is a medical student now, um, is becoming a little bit old hat. I mean, our generation is a little bit different than their generation. And the way we interact with this new generation has to be different. We have mm-hmm. to be a little bit more flexible. Um, mold ourselves to where they can listen to us and they understand what we're saying. And one way that science has shown to kind of make that engagement happen is through games. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's with a board game. And so my first thought was, well, hey, why don't we create a board game focused on endocrinology so that people can see kind of the flow of clinic, kind of understand the basics of endocrinology um, so they can, you know, do better on their board exams, Mm -hmm. do better on their step exams. Um, and then be able to interact with us a little bit better. And by doing that, kind of creating a better and more inducive environment, conducive environment to bring these young people into our specialty, which is suffering. We don't, I mean, we don't have that many pediatric endocrinologists left. I mean, our, our state now only has seven endocrinologists. Wow. Which means that, you know, families have to wait a long time and we have to tell primary care doctors we can't see every kiddo who they want us to see. We have to be very, very focused on the kids that absolutely need us. But if we're able to kind of engage at a young age and bring these people through their training program with something like a board game that, in, that inspires them and gets them kind of interested in endocrinology, then maybe we can increase the number of endocrinologists in the end. That's incredible. So you have a bit of creativity like, going on as well as the flying and the endocrinology. And the cooking. I cook. And the co- and he, we you missed that part, but we he's a very good soup cook. So soup cook, yeah. We discussed our favorite soups. Now that it's November, <laughs> we are excited for cooler weather yeah. and soup. So we mentioned that November is Diabetes Awareness right. Month. Um, let's talk a little bit about that. What are the differences between the types of diabetes? Can you kind of explain to our audience a little more about that specifically? Of course, um, there are several forms of diabetes. The most common form in the pediatric age range is type one. So type one is an autoimmune disease, which means that our bodies create an antibody, which usually protects us against infection or foreign, foreign things invading us. But in this case, individuals with type one develop an antibody that destroys a certain cell called the beta cell. The beta cell is the only cell in our body that creates the only hormone that controls or lowers blood sugar. It doesn't control blood sugar. It lowers blood sugar. And so when you start losing beta cell mass in our system, our ability to make that hormone drops. And because we can't make enough of it anymore, our blood sugars start to go up and there is diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is different. Type 2 diabetes doesn't come from the destruction or loss of these cells or the inability to make insulin. It comes from a process called insulin resistance, which means you can't use it anymore. So type 1 is where you can't make it. Type 2 is where you can't use it. And so there are ways of telling the difference, just kind of visually seeing a child. Um, But sometimes those can be very subtle. So we have to measure things like antibody levels when we first detect diabetes in kids. 
And one of the ways that you assess children is the diabetes management plan form, or is that right. after the fact? That is after the fact. So the diabetes management form is, is basically kind of an order or an order set um, that is individualized for each family. And in that order set, in that letter, um, is kind of the dictation of what we expect a caregiver to bring forward for that child. So if people like um, camp staff, so if they're going to diabetes camp or they're going to another like Boy Scout camp or, or Girl Scout camp, um, if, they're, and, uh, if they go to school, we give this to the school nurse. And so what it tells them what to do are things like what to do with high blood sugars, what to do with low blood sugars, how to give, what dose of insulin to give, what to do with ketones, which are acids that can build up in somebody with type 1 diabetes when their blood sugars are out of control, things like that. Is that something that all types of diabetes get, or is it specific to type 1? So for the most part, we give it to any child that is on insulin. Um, kiddos who are on oral medications sometimes require them, but not always, because some of these medications, especially when they're mild and low dose, they don't necessarily have these kind of wide fluctuations in blood sugars, and so they don't necessarily need it, but sometimes we do. Uh, you've had a long career helping children with diabetes. Um, have you noticed any patterns or anything in this care plan that is more difficult for them to adhere to, process. to, to process, yeah. to, to accept? Yeah, there, there are several steps that families kind of struggle to understand. And of course, what we would consider sick day management, which is when a kiddo has some symptoms of some sort of illness, like throwing up or, or belly pain, not eating as well, coughing, fever, runny nose, those kinds of things. These kiddos can develop ketones in their system, which are those acids that develop when blood sugars are out of control, but they also develop higher blood sugars or even lower blood sugars. And so we, we give them these kind of set guidelines and this step-by-step -step approach to treat sick days, but it is very challenging and we understand that because when you have a kiddo who's sick, you know, it, it's hard to process everything, every step that you're supposed to do. And so um, what I have noticed to be one of the most confusing, most um, difficult to absorb is this kind of step by step process that people have to go through during sick day. Any tips for that? <laughs> um, really, just one is just to be patient with yourself. Take everything slowly and take everything step by step. And if you really need to, we are always there for, an in, for a patient to call and contact. We have a physician that's on call, which will be me next week. Um, we, we have a physician on call 24 hours a day, and we have uh, diabetes educators um, um, with sick day pagers uh, during, the, during the work day. So you mentioned the, the management plan for the school nurse. Um, school these days is a wide variety of activities, sure. you know, sitting still, going to the library, then going to gym and the playground. Um, does activity level affect oh, yeah. children with diabetes? Oh, of course. Yeah. Not only activity level, but stress. Oh, so, so test day. Test day. This is not a great day. day. Yeah. Test, uh, wow, stress I didn't can know affect that. different lunch, lunch options, um, which is very challenging for our kiddos with diabetes because they don't always have a menu in front of them. And when they do have a menu and they know what they're going to eat, they don't know how much of it they're going to eat. They don't know how many carbohydrates, which is what we focus on. In, with insulin treatment, um, how many how many carbohydrates were within that meal? Um, I remember my school lunches; they were pretty much a challenge. The little plastic piece of pizza that we used to get, I liked I it. Loved it was, I, I loved that pizza. I loved it too. That's my favorite. It, Let's bring it back. Uh, that'd be great. But those are, those not are very for, challenging times. Not for you though, because <laughs> it's challenging. But we loved it, right? Right. And that's probably a, a hard thing. Like we love these foods, but we know that they're not great for us, right. diabetes or otherwise. Right. You know? No, that's absolutely right. Yeah, you have to be careful. Uh, how, speaking of when you were a kid, how has diabetes care changed? Oh, um, goodness. Yeah, let's dig into it. Wow. How's it so when since I, the days of square pizza? So I was diagnosed in 81. So um, I'm not going to be one of those guys that says the needles were that long when I was. But, <laughs> but they needle were. size was much bigger, right? Yeah, yeah they were. They were much bigger. Um, we were just getting out of the time frame where uh, syringes and needles were reused. They were like those metal ones, you know? I forgot about that time frame. Yeah, so they would use, um, in, our, in the diabetes camp that I was involved with in Dallas, in the 1980s, they were using reusable needles that they had to sharpen every time. Yeah. And so I was, I, I was fortunately- I asking this question, that's terrible. Fortunately, that wasn't me, but needle size was a lot larger. Um, we were just getting out of testing urine 
pre-meal and post-meal to decide on insulin dosing changes? Because if you had no sugar in your urine before a meal, but sugar in your urine after a meal, you probably needed more insulin for that meal because blood sugar kind of spills over into urine. It was a, it was a way to detect high blood sugars. So it was a lot more difficult. Oh, it was a, it was a lot more difficult. But as I went through the first couple of years of my diabetes, we went through quickly, thankfully, the technical advances of actually checking blood sugar. So finger pricking blood sugars was actually a new thing back then. Wow. And now over the course of 42 years, we have gone from, you know, animal substrate insulin to human um, genetically uh, derived insulins, much better, much cleaner, much easier to be made, um, to ultra fast acting insulin, to pumps, to pumps that interact with a continuous glucose monitoring system that can communicate with your pump and alter the amount of insulin. So it's a vast, a vast array of different things that have made things much, much better. <laughs> and much easier for families, but it's still, diabetes is still a chronic and very difficult to manage disease. It's still a process, but a little it bit is. better than it used to be at least. It, it is. How often do you find yourself, I walked uphill both ways in the snow to get my as diabetes many times test. As, as they will listen to me. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be a hard one not to after yeah, going through Especially with that. my kids. I have yeah. To, yeah. Oh, you did mention your, your daughter was in medical school. What is she, does she have plans for what she's going to go into? I keep telling her she's legacy, so she has to be an endocrinologist, but <laughs> she does not listen to me. She wants to be either an anesthesiologist, I believe, or a pathologist. Break out the board game. Convince her over the weekend. I will try Make that. some soup. Uh, she is going to be part of the test program, though. Oh, that's amazing. Her and her, her um, classmates, yes. Well, maybe you'll get her. You never know. <laughs> you never get her. She should just listen to her father. <laughs> I agree. If my children are watching this, Listen to your parents. That's right. Always listen to your parents. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I, I've heard you have a new retinal eye exam oh, yeah. that is mm -hmm. helpful. So tell me all about it. So it, it is um, called TopCon. Um, the nurses affectionately describe it as goose. Call it goose. Oh, you said TopCon, and I heard Top Gun, and yep, now that's we're what everybody like does. So <laughs> great, it's I love goose. it. I'm already um, hooked. So basically, what we have had, we have run into over the past ye several years. Um, is that families have a hard time getting to an ophthalmologist to do their yearly eye exams. And what those eye exams entail is kind of looking in the back on our retinas, looking at va um, vascular uh, permeability, vascular health. Mm -hmm. um, and so an ophthalmologist can tell if there's been any um, diabetes related damage to our retina, which would cause what's called diabetic retinopathy, poor vision and, and et cetera. Um, so this TopCon machine takes a picture of the back of our eyes, the retinal part of our eyes, and that image is sent to an ophthalmologist in a different institution. That ophthalmologist reads it and sends us the report back. And if everything is negative, then we have a report that's done yearly, and it's nice. We can see it. We know everything compare. is okay, yeah. and we can compare. And then um, if there is something abnormal on it, then we know to send those kids immediately to an ophthalmologist to have it checked up. That's a pretty cool machine. It is a very cool it, machine. It owns, it lives up to its nickname. Yes. Right? Yes. So we have talked a lot about diabetes, but I would not want to let you go before I ask when a parent thinks their kid may have diabetes and they're coming in, what are the common symptoms? What are the common complaints or reasons for, Hey, I'm here for this and I'm worried. That's a great question. The, the most common things that we see are, um, what doctors will term polyuria and polydipsia, which means the kids are urinating more and they're drinking more. And this is not usually something that's subtle. So right. it's not, Hey, it's hot outside and a kiddo has been drinking for a few hours more than normal. It is constant. It is day and it is night. Kids will wake up in the middle of the night. They will drink. They will wake up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom. We have had kids who have been potty trained or are in their teenage years who all of a sudden start to wet the bed. And those are the signs and symptoms that people will come to see us for. Fatigue is another good one. So they're just not able to get up and, and, and move because their body's no longer able to utilize our main fuel, which is sugar. Um, it has to revert to things like fats and proteins. And if you guys have ever been on a diet like the Atkins diet, you go through that keto flu. It is very similar to the keto flu where you just are transitioning from sugar in your diet to the ketones that your body's burning off, but it's, it's 10 times worse and it doesn't ever go away. So fatigue is a big one. Weight loss is a huge one. Mm. Okay. And so those are what people will come to see us for. 
And how do you test for that? Is it a blood test? So at the at for diabetes, it's a blood test looking at a, a blood sugar, mm -hmm. and then it's also a, a something called a hemoglobin A one C, which looks at an average blood sugar over the past three months. And there are defined values that we're looking for in the fasting state, in the fed state, for the blood sugar, but also um, what the level is in that hemoglobin A one C that would define diabetes versus not diabetes. I think you mentioned pre-diabetes earlier, and I meant to ask you to explain what pre-diabetes is. So in the past, that's actually a really good question. I'm glad you asked because this kind of allows me to work on something else with you guys. So um, <laughs> pre-diabetes is, is fun. I can't wait. I'm sorry. Um, pre-diabetes used to be solely focused on type 2, type 2 diabetes, because right. there was a slower progression from a normal glucose state to a pre-diabetes state to the actual diabetes state. So several years. And so if we had a kiddo who is at risk of developing type two diabetes, which means that their weight was a little bit high, um, they had a, a skin finding that was kind of dark, coarse skin around their neck called acanthosis. They had a, a family history of type two diabetes. Um, then these kiddos could be screened for diabetes and they would check that hemoglobin A1C, which again is just an average uh, blood sugar for the past three months. And the American Diabetes Association has defined prediabetes based on that hemoglobin A1C. So a hemoglobin A1C between 5.7 and 6.4, that's prediabetes. Below 5.7 is kind of normal. Above 6.5 and above is diabetes. That seems like not a very wide window. It's not. It's So it's just a, a hairline between just fine and diabetes. And it's open to interpretation as well. We get a lot of referrals for kiddos with hemoglobin A1Cs of 5.7, 5.8, 5.9. But the truth is many kids live there and the blood sugars are normally just have a little bit of a higher number at that time. And that's not something that we get too worried about. So we focus more on kids with 6.0, 6.3, 6.4. Now, in that particular state, there is this a little bit more impetus to delay that type 2 diabetes. And so lifestyle management, sometimes medications can be brought brought forth to help kind of slow down the progress of diabetes. And that if done well, and the kiddo really wants to do that, you can actually be very successful in kind of staving off the development of type 2 diabetes. Whereas if they don't, they can develop type 2 diabetes within two years of that particular diagnosis. Is it inevitable if you're diagnosed with pre-diabetes, will you absolutely? If you don't do anything, it is it is more than likely. I wouldn't say it's but inevitable. But if you, if you do the things. If you do the things, you have a much Can you much avoid lower, it? You can't. Yes. Oh, you, you can't. Okay, good. Because for a minute, I was like, oh, I didn't realize that it was just like, it's coming for it, you no matter what. It, it, it yes. And it, it, it would be much better if you, you did, did what your the, doctor said. Yes, do. So, bottom exercise, line. Exercise, diet, yes. yes. So, but the thing that is recently come to, to light is that there is a pre-diabetes form of type 1 diabetes. It's called stage 2. So there's stages to, di to type 1 diabetes. The first stage is where you develop antibodies, and that can happen as early as nine months, okay? Mm -hmm. But blood sugars are fine. Stage 2 is where you have these antibodies, but your blood sugars are starting to go up, okay? Developing pre-diabetes, if you will. And that's stage two. And then stage three is the full-blown type 1 diabetes with polyuria, polydipsia, weight loss, really high blood sugars, um, and those antibodies are still positive. With type 1 diabetes and pre-type 1 diabetes, it, it will come no matter what you do. Is that right? I'm because glad you it's asked an that autoimmune, too. right? You said it's an autoimmune disease. But Did remember, I make that up? We have developed treatments for autoimmune diseases, okay, I'm rheumatoid listening. arthritis, Crohn's disease, right? We have right. all these injections that help. Recently, there has been a medication called tepluzumab or T-Zield that has been approved for kids eight and above who have stage two type one diabetes. They have stage two diabetes, type one diabetes. They don't really have type one diabetes. They have stage two. Pre-diabetes. Pre-type one diabetes, okay. yes. It's a lot of words. And so if you have stage two and you are eight and above, um, we can give kiddos this medication and that reduces the risk of developing full-blown type 1 diabetes wow. by about 50%. Wow. And it can last, that effect can last up to two to three years. And 
eventually, I believe, it's not quite true yet, but eventually I think the FDA is going to approve multiple infusions for these kids because there have been children in these research studies who have fended off type 1 diabetes for over 10 years. Wow, that's incredible. So we are getting into a, a time frame where, for me, back in the 1980s, we were lucky to have insulin and injections, and it was, it, it was a life-saving event. Now we're going through pumps that are very, very smart. Mm -hmm. And then in the next year or two, we're going to have an actual infusion. I mean, we, we have it now. We have an infusion that can potentially prevent, at least for a couple of years, the development of, of a chronic, difficult to control disease. Yeah. Which is a, very exciting. Very, that really is, that's very exciting. Is that a research study that we have held here? It's clinically available. It is FDA approved. It, we can give it to kiddos, but that's we amazing. have to be able to screen them, identify them, and then, and then get them on that list. We have the order sets that are ready. Arkansas Children's has, has um, allowed us to do this. They have put forward all the support that we need. Um, we have a plan. We just need to get those kids in clinic and we need to find them and, and, and start the treatment. You have a personal connection to this, so this question probably would mean more to you than it would if I asked anybody else. But how incredible is it to watch this type of technology progress oh, it's, from what you experienced as a kid to, to this new stuff? It's fabulous. It's fabulous not just for me, but for all of us. Yeah, it's incredible. Um, Jennifer Sellers is one of our uh, diabetes educators who has been with us over 20 years, and her experience and perspective is, has been such that she has kind of led the charge in the screening clinic, like getting kids in to screen them. And she's worked really hard to do this because she is very excited. I don't mean to speak for her, but she's very excited. I believe you. I think you're speaking. I think it's okay. Uh, that's incredible. Thank you for sharing that. Is that was that the thing? Because I was that's excited about it, yeah, and it, it was worth it. Yeah. I, I really, that was incredible no, to hear. No, I don't Okay. Uh, is there any, thing that we did not cover that you feel like people should know about what you do, the kids you see, the amazing work that's happening in your department? Um, I, no, I think, I think the screening program and the fact that we're very um, pro pump, pro uh, closed loop system, which is this kind of smart pump that, that reacts to blood sugars. I think that is the key thing to understand about our program, that we are kind of cutting edge. We have very mm -hmm. open minds. We're very forward thinking. Um, so no, I don't think so. I think just awesome. as long as we get that out. Well, I've got one last question that I ask right. everybody. Um, what is your favorite part about your job? So I, I think I, I've got a lot of really good things about my job that I like. Um, the, the best thing about my job is, is being able to see these kiddos. I think, um, it's, it's not always a happy day to have a kiddo come in with new onset diabetes, but it is a happy day when you see that they react very well, um, they respond very well, and families absorb the information very well. And I think in those kids, they are very, 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 very successful. Um, and again, we, I try to emphasize when I'm in that hospital room with that family that their kiddo is going to be fine. Right. Their kiddo is going to do well. There is no restrictions in school, they can do whatever they want to. They can be on the debate team, they can be on the football team, they can be on the basketball team, they can be a cheerleader, they can do whatever they want. They can go to sleepovers, okay? That's something that people kind of think about before they send a kiddo who is on insulin to another house right. where they can't see them. I mean, it's something, little things like that, they hard have to Hard not to worry. It's hard not for parents not to worry. Yeah. Um, but they can also be whatever they wanna be when they grow up. There's only one job really that they cannot be, and this sometimes does break kids' hearts, but there's only one job in this that, that is left that we cannot participate in, and that's active service in the military. But the, wow. but the key message is that when I started doing this, there were five jobs that we couldn't do. There was a uh, commercial truck driver, commercial airline pilot, military service, and there were a few other things, wow. but those things have all kind of gone away. These are things that, I would never have known. Like I would never have known there was a list of jobs that you were yeah. not able to do because you had diabetes. Yeah, that's it's crazy to think about. But interesting. Uh, in military service, it kind of makes sense, right? I mean, yeah. you don't really want to be 
in, a soldier yeah. with insulin and then oops we can't get your insulin to you so that's yeah. that's not going to work yeah. out very well so it, it makes sense i understand but, it it's just but I, to personally i think that there is a space in the military for people with diabetes who want to serve their country i think there is a space for them but that's not they didn't ask it, us they didn't ask me so yeah. <laughs> well so from five jobs to one that's that's not that's too not bad. bad yeah you We're can be anything you want to be just just this one thing right it's, it's, yeah. an, it's not so many things right well i love it dr odin thank you so much for joining us today i have learned a lot a lot more than i learned when i googled so that's always a <laughs> that's good always thing good. um your passion for what you do just really shines through and i appreciate what you do for the kids here at arkansas children well, it's, it's a pleasure to be here thank you for inviting me awesome uh, thank you guys for joining us and stay tuned for our next episode of better today healthier tomorrow an arkansas children's podcast have a great day